Hello, my name is Howard Breyer. I am a volunteer walking tour guide for the Miami Design Preservation League. One of the tours I lead is South Beach Scandals. This presentation has been adapted from that tour and retitled Miami Beach Scandals. If you are interested in taking the tour, check out the schedule at the Preservation League's website, mdpl.org. Over the past 100 years, Miami Beach has gone from a swamp to a world-famous resort. It's said that if you build a city on a swamp, expect slimy creatures. Mobsters, murderers, corrupt mayors. They've all been part of the Miami Beach landscape. During the presentation, we will take a look at the dark side of the city, from illegal alcohol use during Prohibition to organized crime figures and their activities, from drug smugglers to dirty politicians. This is Mango's Tropical Cafe, one of the top grossing bars or nightclubs in the United States. It takes in about 20 to 25 million dollars each year. Of course, alcohol consumption has been and continues to be a big draw of Miami Beach. Even during Prohibition, when alcohol was illegal in the country, it was available in the city. Prohibition movements arose across America throughout the 1800s, spearheaded by religious groups who considered alcohol and drunkenness to be a national curse. Since the end of the Civil War, saloons had become increasingly violent, regarded by many as a menace to the American family. In 1873, the Women's Christian Temperance Union advocated abolishing the trafficking of alcohol. By 1916, almost half the states, 23 out of 48, had adopted anti-saloon legislation. Many of these states also prohibited the manufacture of alcoholic beverages as well. In January 1919, the states ratified the 18th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which placed a nationwide ban on the manufacture and transportation of intoxicating liquor. Dade County, Florida, which includes Miami Beach, outlawed alcohol even earlier in 1913. There was some enforcement of the law, but it wasn't strict. The pictures here are of government authorities destroying liquor bottles and an advertisement for a bar, both from 1925. President Warren Harding visited Miami Beach in 1921 and shared several drinks with Carl Fisher and his friends. Fisher, a multimillionaire originally from Indiana, was the key developer in Miami Beach in the teens and 1920s and was the first person to conceive of Miami Beach as possibly being a resort community. Being close to the Bahamas and the Caribbean, where alcohol was still legal, the South Florida coast became a hot spot for rum running, the illegal smuggling of alcohol via boat. Rum runners would transport their illegal goods to the infamous Rum Row, which was a stretch of ocean that lay just beyond the U.S. territorial limits along the eastern seaboard. Boats carrying liquor of every sort delivered the smuggled cargo to accomplices on the mainland, while avoiding the interference of custom officials and other lawmen. One account of Prohibition-era Miami Beach had limousines lined up at the wharves to welcome the boats laden with bootleg liquor that came in from Havana, Bimini, and Nassau. People drove off with their, quote, fish, neatly wrapped in brown paper. At other times, that fish was shipped north in refrigerated railroad cars under cover of grapefruit, tomatoes, or avocados. Bill McCoy, a Miami sailor, was a pioneer in the rum running trade. He increased his productivity by repacking liquor bottles into a clever form of packaging he invented, the ham. To create the ham, Straw was stuffed into the bottoms of burlap bags, and six bottles were arranged to form triangular sacks that were sewn shut. 
cams could transport three times more liquor than wooden cases and better protected the illegal goods from damage during transportation. McCoy created an image for himself as a fair and honest dealer. His booze was never watered down or relabeled, and he never paid bribes for government protection. What customers saw was what they got, allegedly the derivation of the famous phrase, the real McCoy. By the late 1920s, a movement for repeal was well underway. Many feared prohibition's infringement upon the American tradition of individual freedom more than they feared alcohol. The early years of the Great Depression raised still more concerns. With unemployment paralyzing the nation, it was argued that prohibition denied workers' jobs and government's revenue. In 1933, the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition was ratified in Congress, with 93% voting in favor of repeal. The success of Florida's rum running businesses during Prohibition in the 1920s led to its reputation as a safe haven for organized crime figures. Pictured is a postcard of the New Paddock Club, a burlesque house in the 1930s and 40s, said to be frequented by many organized crime members. It was located at 7th Street and Washington Avenue. The building was later the site of Friedman's Bakery and Manolo Restaurant. Two of the most famous organized crime figures eventually came to live in Miami Beach, Al Capone and Meyer Lansky. Capone was born in New York, but became the crime boss of Chicago. By 1928, he had been called the greatest gang leader in history. His brutality was legendary even during his lifetime. It was widely known, though almost impossible to prove, that he engineered dozens of murders. He also operated profitable prostitution rings and speakeasies. Capone spent his first winter in Miami Beach in 1927 using the name Al Brown. In 1928, he bought a house on Palm Island, one of the islands in Biscayne Bay between Miami and Miami Beach. The house still stands and is pictured here. Many residents opposed his living here and wanted to force him to leave believing the reputation of the city was being sullied. In May 1928, the city council unanimously voted to oppose his presence. Among those voting was the mayor of Miami Beach, J. N. Lummis. However, Lummis later admitted that his real estate company had sold Capone the Palm Island house. Capone managed to stay. Poker games and parties were common at the Capone estate. Among the guests were Joe E. Lewis, George Jessel, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, and other entertainers who performed in Miami Beach nightclubs. On the day of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago in 1929, Capone invited more than 100 people to his Palm Island home for a party. While Capone's thugs machine-gunned seven members of the rival Bugsy Moran gang in Chicago, a half dozen bodyguards served champagne to Capone's guests, providing him with scores of witnesses who could account for his whereabouts at the time of the killings. In 1932, Capone was sentenced to imprisonment at Alcatraz for income tax evasion. Upon his release in 1939, he returned to Palm Island. He lived out the last years of his life suffering from complications of syphilis. The symptoms included paranoia, tremors, and jerking motions when he walked. In January 1947, Capone collapsed with a brain hemorrhage, followed a week later by bronchial pneumonia. He died at his home on January 25th at the age of 48. Meyer Lansky was born in Russia in 1902, but grew up in New York. Famously, as a young boy, Lansky fiercely defended himself against a group of older Italian youths who were roaming the neighborhood looking for Jewish boys to extort protection money from. The leader was so impressed with Lansky's tenacity and fearlessness in standing up to the group that the leader let Lansky off the hook. That day, a lifelong bond of mutual admiration and respect was formed between the two, 
who in later years would become business partners and staunch allies. The leader of the Italians was a teenage Charles Lucky Luciano. By the early 1920s, Lansky, along with Luciano and Bugsy Siegel, had become partners in various rackets, including bootlegging and labor extortion. The top picture displays a famous Lansky quote, stating that his operations were larger than U.S. Steel, one of the largest companies in America at the time. After Prohibition's demise in 1933, Lansky set about diversifying his business operations, attempting to invest in both legitimate and illegitimate enterprises. His primary source of income, however, remained gambling. Throughout the 1930s, he opened up several carpet joints, meaning they were so fancy they had carpets on the floors, gambling locations in upstate New York, New Orleans, and Florida. He also invested heavily in a dog track in Hallandale, Florida, the base of his gambling universe. In the 1940s and 50s, Lansky became involved in Cuban gambling operations, most famously at the National Hotel in Havana. The 1959 Cuban Revolution put an end to Lansky's Havana investments when the casinos were nationalized and he was forced to come back to the United States. Lansky then settled in Miami Beach, for the most part living quietly in the Imperial House condominium located at 5255 Collins Avenue. The bottom photo is of Lansky walking his dog on Collins Avenue. He belonged to Congregation Beth Jacob, now the Jewish Museum of Florida. He donated money for one of the stained glass windows there, and his name can be seen at the bottom of the window, along with a small di display about his life. There were rumors that he had amassed a fortune of $300 million. The government tried to prosecute him, but was not successful. He died of lung cancer in Miami Beach in 1983, and no trace of his fortune was ever found. In the 1930s, gambling, both legal and illegal, became a major attraction in South Florida. The state passed a law in 1931 legalizing racetrack betting. Hialeah Racetrack was such an immediate success that its racing dates, from January 1st to March 15th, became the unofficial tourist season. Slot machines were legalized for a brief time in 1935, but proliferated even after their banishment later that same year, as the government was loath to crack down on such a lucrative enterprise, which brought a lot of money into the city and state. Illegal bookmaking, off-track betting on horse races, became widespread. Pictured here is a bookie working the phones in the 1940s. The bookies often operated in hotels in a cabana in the pool area or a room off the main lobby. Often there is an indication in the floor that an establishment featured gambling. Here are arrows in the terrazzo floor of the Essex House Hotel at Collins Avenue and 10th Street leading customers into the small room off the lobby where the gambling took place. Patrons would not have to ask where the gambling room was. In 1944, Miami Beach's S&G Gambling Syndicate was established by five local bookmakers. No one knows for sure what the initials S&G stood for, but it may have been for stop and go. When there was any sort of government law enforcement, the bookies had to temporarily stop operations. When the government looked the other way, operations could go on. By 1948, they controlled bookmaking operations in 200 hotels and grossed over $26 million in bets. There's an anecdote that in the late 1940s, one could walk up and down Collins Avenue and continuously hear racing results from radios in hotels along the way. Much of the illegal gambling in Miami Beach ended after a government crackdown in the early 1950s. A key person in the crackdown was Melvin Richard. He arrived in Miami Beach in the early 1930s when his family moved here from Brooklyn. In 1935, he opened a law office in Miami Beach. 
Soon after that, he became a municipal judge, known as incorruptible in a time when many could be bought off. After a stint in the Navy during World War II, he returned home where, where he became a Miami Beach City Councilman and found the city filled with corruption. He soon turned his attention to the s g Gambling Syndicate and made it his goal to rid the city of illegal gambling. The s g tried and failed many times to bribe Richard, offering him as much as $200,000 to find some other civic injustices to rail against. When he turned down the payoffs, the syndicate not so subtly volunteered to help him relocate to North Carolina. When that strategy also failed, the syndicate spent a million dollars on a voter recall to have Richard removed from the Miami Beach City Council. The issue eventually reached a court the s g couldn't control, the Florida Supreme Court, and the recall was quashed. Still feeling the heat from the s g Richard got a big break in 1950 when he caught the ear of U.S. Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee, who headed a special Senate committee investigating crime in America. Kefauver agreed to conduct an investigation and came armed with a persuasive new weapon, television. In televised hearings, Kefauver called the syndicate Miami's public enemy number one, and the nation learned exactly how the s g had taken over Miami Beach. Those people who did not yet own a TV could watch the hearings for free in movie theaters. Eventually, two of the five s g members were convicted of wrongdoing. However, citing the lax enforcement of gambling laws, the judge gave them light sentences, a $5,000 fine for one and a $4,000 fine for the other, and suspended two-year prison terms and three years on probation for both. But the days of widespread illegal gambling in Miami Beach were numbered, and these types of activities greatly diminished after the early 1950s. Melvin Richard continued his career and went on to become the mayor of Miami Beach in the early 1960s. Miami Beach's well-known 5th Street boxing gym opened in 1950 at the corner of 5th Street and Washington Avenue. It was opened by two brothers, Chris and Angelo Dundee. If you're a boxing fan, you might recognize the name Angelo Dundee, a famed boxing trainer. His most famous trainee was Muhammad Ali, who did much of his training in Miami Beach. Ali won his first heavyweight title in Miami Beach in February 1964, defeating Sonny Liston at the Miami Beach Convention Center. Note that his name was Cassius Clay until after the 1964 title fight. While Ali was training for the fight, the Beatles were on their first American visit. They visited only three cities, New York, Washington, D.C., and Miami Beach. While they were in Miami Beach, they visited Ali at the gym. So far, I've mentioned seven people in connection with the gym the two Dundees, Ali, and the four Beatles. None of them are connected to any scandal, at least not in Miami Beach. However, here is a shady character with a connection to the gym, Benjamin Evil I. Finkel. He moved to Miami Beach in 1938 and lived here until he passed away in 1978. He had two careers, both based out of the Fifth Street gym. His first career was as a boxer, which didn't amount to much. He only had a few fights. However, he's more known for his second career. It was said that what Babe Ruth was to baseball, Caruso was to opera, and Charlie Chaplin was to the movies, Evil Eye Finkel was to the hex. For a total of $50 to $300 per fight, Evil Eye would be hired by a boxer to put a hex or a spell on his opponent. He also used his powers for baseball games and horse racing. There was a big article about Evil Eye in Sports Illustrated magazine in the early 1970s. Sports Illustrated called him a boxing legend, a rascal who mixed two parts voodoo with one part fraud and lurched through life unburdened by honest labor. Pictured are Miami Beach's two most recent City Hall buildings. On top, the building that was City Hall from 1927 to 1977 and on the bottom, the City Hall since 1977. 
There have been many examples of corrupt politicians in the history of the city, but I will focus on one, former mayor Alex Dowd. Dowd was born and grew up in Miami Beach and was elected to the Miami Beach City Commission in 1979. He was re-elected to a second term in 1981 and then a third term in 1983. In 1985, he became the mayor of Miami Beach. In 1987, he won re-election with 83% of the popular vote. In 1989, he was re-elected to an unprecedented third term as mayor of Miami Beach. In 1991, Dowd was indicted by a federal grand jury on a total of 41 counts, charging that he unlawfully obtained personal benefits, including money, property, and services from contractors, developers, and unions, by improperly using his position as mayor. He was also charged with extortion, money laundering, and filing false federal income tax returns. He faced up to 520 years in prison and fines of $12.5 million. He was convicted and served 18 months in a federal prison, his lenient sentence due to his testifying against other alleged criminals, after which he retired from politics. After his release, he admitted that many, though not all, of the charges against him were true. As is often the case of convicted and disgraced politicians, Dowd has made a comeback, though not in electoral politics. In 2007, he published Sins of South Beach, an autobiographical depiction of Miami Beach in the 1980s and its revitalization as a premier vacation and nightlife destination in the United States. In it, he recounts, while serving as city commissioner and mayor, going on vigilante patrols to search for and beat up criminals. This building at 7th Street and Ocean Drive was the filming location of one of the most notable scenes in the 1983 movie Scarface. Directed by Brian De Palma and written by Oliver Stone, the film tells the story of Cuban refugee Tony Montana, played by Al Pacino, who arrives in 1980s Miami with nothing and rises to become a powerful drug kingpin. The scene shot here was an attack on an associate of Tony's with a chainsaw. Here are three stills from that scene. The movie was a reflection of the troubles facing South Florida, including Miami Beach, in the early 1980s. Federal authorities estimated that by 1980, 70% of all the cocaine and marijuana entering the country passed through South Florida. The government said the annual Miami illegal drug trade brought in about $12 billion, outpacing the area's two largest legitimate businesses, $11 billion in real estate and $9 billion in tourism. In 1980, law enforcement officials seized 3.2 million pounds of marijuana and 2,300 pounds of cocaine in and around the area, but it's likely that 90% of all drugs smuggled in were not found. Here is a picture of seized cocaine. Notice the coke machine in the background. There were two primary methods of bringing drugs into the country. One was by a combination of airplanes and boats, as depicted in this picture. Airplanes dropped off the drugs in the Bahamas, then fast boats would bring the drugs to the shore. Drug smugglers watched out for law enforcement officials through a sophisticated combination of aircraft and trackers on land. Two, drug smuggling was also done via airplanes alone. Officials estimated that some 80 planes secretly landed in the U.S. every night carrying illegal drugs, most of them landing in South Florida. The cocaine trade was tr controlled by Colombians and Cubans, the marijuana trade primarily by Anglos. Smuggling drugs was a lucrative business. The pay for one night's work piloting a boat averaged $50,000, while the wages for unloading the drugs on shore were five to $10,000 a night. If caught, suspected drug dealers were often released on bail of $1 million or more. They typically paid it within hours, sometimes in cash, and skipped town. 
dealers regarded the forfeited bail as a cost of doing business. If a prosecutor's case was airtight, officials were sometimes bought off. One lawyer for the drug dealer said, We pay for what we need as we need it. If we can't bribe the cop, we try to buy, bribe the prosecutor. And if we can't get the prosecutor, we try to buy the judge. The drug trade brought with it a rise in murders, often one dealer killing others. Every year starting in 1979, murders in Miami set a record. 349 in 1979, 569 in 1980, 621 in 1981. 50% were drug-related, 25% died from machine gun fire, and 15% were public executions. The Dade County Medical Examiner's Office rented a refrigerated trailer from Burger King to handle the overflow of corpses. In 1980, Time Magazine named Miami the nation's crime capital and the home of the largest narcotics network in America. Eventually, the importation of drugs slowed down, though never disappeared. The number of murders has decreased considerably. In 2017, there were 93 murders in the county, 85% less than in 1981. The next topic is not a scandal in and of itself, but is the story of a television show that depicted many scandals. The pictures below are several stills from a scene of the show, Miami Vice. This scene was shot in front of the Victor Hotel on Ocean Drive and 12th Street. The show was a crime drama series starring Don Johnson as James Sonny Crockett and Philip Michael Thomas as Ricardo Rico Tubbs, two Metro-Dade Police Department detectives working undercover in Miami. The series ran on NBC from 1984 to 1989. Unlike standard police shows, Miami Vice drew heavily upon 1980s new wave culture and music. The show became noted for its integration of music and visual effects. It's recognized as one of the most influential television series of all time and was one of the highest rated shows of the 1980s. It was eventually shown in many countries around the world. People Magazine stated that Miami Vice was the first show to look really new and different since color TV was invented. Most episodes focused on combating drug trafficking and prostitution. Episodes often ended in an intense gun battle, claiming the lives of several criminals before they could be apprehended. Many episodes were filmed in South Beach, which at the time was blighted by poverty and crime. The show's rock video glitz and glamour dispelled the image of Miami Beach as God's waiting room. Miami Vice took the city's Art Deco buildings, blue skies, pastels, and population, and even crime, and made them something cool and chic. It catapulted Miami onto magazine covers and fashion show runways into department stores and boutiques. The show's economic impact was felt almost immediately as film and photography shooting soared and South Florida became the darling of actors, models, and photographers. Miami Vice's legacy continues today. The show is credited for helping to jumpstart the preservation of South Beach's Art Deco architecture, which featured prominently in the series. This is one of the most famous buildings in Miami Beach, commonly known as the Versace Mansion, and was the home of the well-known Italian fashion designer, Johnny Versace. It was built in 1930 as a single-family residence for Alden Freeman. The total construction cost was $105,000. The building was inspired by the Alcazar de Colon in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, built by Christopher Columbus's son, Diego. Freeman lived here until he passed away in 1937. At that point, it was converted to a 22-unit apartment house called the Amsterdam Palace. Versace purchased the building in 1992 and made it his home, but by that time it had physically deteriorated along with many other buildings in the area. Versace paid $6.9 million for the property. He then spent $30 million renovating the house. 
In the early and mid-1990s, the economic revival of South Beach was in full swing. Celebrities were starting to come. There were a lot of fashion shoots and the filming of movies, TV shows, and commercials. Versace was in the middle of all that and was a catalyst for much of what was going on at the time. One reason the building is so well known is not a good reason. It was also the site of Versace's murder. The date was July 15, 1997. He had gone out to the news cafe, was just returning to the home, had reached the front steps, and there was a man waiting to shoot him. That man's name was Andrew Cunanan. He was on a cross-country killing spree. Versace was his fifth and final victim. No one knows for sure why he shot Versace or the other victims. After he sh shot Versace here, he fled to a houseboat about three miles away, and before he was captured, he committed suicide. Today, the building houses a luxury hotel, Villa Casa Cuisarina, and restaurant Johnny's. In 2018, the assassination of Johnny Versace, American Crime Story, was the second season of the FX true crime anthology TV series, American Crime Story. Much of it was filmed on location in Miami Beach. By the 1990s, the Russian Mafia had spread from Russia to many countries throughout the world, including the United States. Recently, it has become to be the FBI's number one priority in South Florida among organized crime groups after a string of recent nightclub busts. Beginning in 2009, members of an Eastern European network working in the Miami area, led by Alec Simchuk, along with about a dozen bar girls or B-girls, imported mostly from Latvia and Estonia, were charged with conspiring to tempt and rob South Beach tourists by racking up their credit card bills for alcohol at private bars on Washington Avenue. Pictured here are two of the bars, Nowhere and Steel Toast. Once at a bar, the women made sure that the men got exceedingly drunk and then ran up huge alcohol charges on their credit cards. The clubs even had vases where the women would pour out drinks so the men would have to order more. One victim, former Philadelphia TV weatherman John Bolaris, testified that he was charged some $43,000 over two nights through the scheme. There was a crackdown in 2011. Simchuk, the ringleader, initially fled to Russia just before he and 18 others were indicted by a federal grand jury. A year later, he agreed to surrender and cooperate, even though his leg had been broken by mobsters as a warning not to cooperate with the authorities. Simchuk received a three-year prison term after pleading guilty of wire fraud and conspiracy to defraud the U.S., which could have landed him in prison for a much longer term had he not testified against others. In court, Simchuk said he was sorry and pleaded for another chance to live an honest life. In all, 12 of those charged in the scheme pleaded guilty, including most of the B-girls who were deported. In addition, three men were convicted in a trial. That ends our look at Miami Beach scandals. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you for watching.